Oh, let's get rid of this. Okay, so I put up two projects today for SQL injection and PHP, and these are <coughs> absurdly easy, like embarrassingly easy that I can't even worth doing. You just go through demonstrations I did in class. However, to compensate, I have one here that's fun that called Exploit Hackathon. See, Hackathon you've had for a while, and the thing about Hackathon is it had a bug. So you couldn't see the SQL injections, and I fixed that bug. Although this is kind of disturbing. Neat. Now it appears to be broken. Cool. Um, well, I can restore it from a backup, but um, it may be that my doing this project broke it, in which case students are going to be breaking it a lot more. Um, let me just uh, reboot it. Let's go to my cloud, which is um, DigitalOcean. Okay. We'll see if rebooting it does any good. Um, and there it is. Well, I can be a little more polite than that. I guess we do this SSH root at hackos. Okay. In fact, I could just restart Apache, I suppose. Shouldn't really help, though. Huh. Um, how can it have a, see, a section on the home page? That means that one of my exploits corrupted the database, probably. Uh, all right. So maybe I'm not going to be able to show you anything about this right away. OK. Um, that's rude. All right. Well, let's go on to other things, then. <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid the procedure I told you to use destroys the database. Neat. That'll be fun. All right. So I, I, but I'll, have to, I'll probably just have to put a cron job that reinstalls it like every hour or something, or a button someplace that reinstalls it. That's a pretty good idea anyway. When you let people do SQL injections, they can totally screw the thing up. And I was using an automated tool, so I didn't even know what damage it did. Sort of like that one you have where it says hit the reset. Right. The right. So I'm going to have to put a reset button on the Hackazon, which there certainly is a script I can run. But all right, so um, let's talk. Anyway, we're doing SQL injection. Let me bring it up here, which is here. And it's this one. All right, so uh, let me get rid of that. And all right, so we're just this is more advanced features in SQL injection. SQL injection can get very complicated and tedious, um, but there's a few more general features we're copying here. I, th I think all the details aren't worth it, but this, what's in your book is pretty good. So one thing you do is you have filters. One common defense is to block or escape apostrophes and so on, and that's not really going to do it because you can inject into a numerical field, and you can even supposedly use character functions to build something character by character, although when I try to actually do something significant with it, it doesn't work on my MySQL database. But anyway, here's some examples. If you wanted to make the name Marcus, you could make it by spelling out characters one by one, and that's how you might do it if those letters are blocked. But you notice the example here does not have you putting in an apostrophe, and when I try putting in an apostrophe with this technique, it does not work. So there are subtleties there. That's why I didn't put it in your homework, because I couldn't make it work. So the other thing is you might have the comment signal block. They might take, not that you have the dash dash or the pound or anything. And if that happens, then you can't just casually put a comment at the end of your injection to terminate it. But you don't really need that. And this is something I learned from the SQLOL labs. You, you just have to write it more carefully. You can apostrophe or A equals A, and you know there's going to put an apostrophe there. So you don't need a, a, a pound terminator. You can just design your queries correctly so that they will work anyway. All right, and then if select is blocked, this is actually quite, a, this is true of web application firewalls, quite a bit of them. They will just have, a lot of web application firewalls are what a lot of people buy. Instead of actually improving their code, they just pay money for a firewall and it blocks the SQL attacks, but most of them are incredibly stupid. They just go to like Wikipedia and take like 100 common SQL injection attacks and then recognize them like viruses on the web, or they take a normal attack tool like SQL map or um, Havij and they measure what it does, and they just block exactly those strings as if they were viruses. So all you have to do is modify them a little bit, like mixing the upper and lower case, putting a null in front of it. This one's kind of fun. You put half a select here, you put another one in the middle, you put another one here, because if they do one pass of substitution, it'll get rid of this select, but it will not notice that what's left is now select. Um, and here's where you encode it with uh, ASCII, and here's where you double encode it with ASCII. This print 25 is going to turn into percent, and that'll turn into a 53. 
that worked in the old versions of IIS. I'm not sure what it works in now, but I've heard a lot of stories that this is very common. Most of the web application firewalls are fooled by these simple things. Um, all right, and then there's comments. You can put comments in instead of spaces, and supposedly you can put comments in the middle of words, keywords like select, but again, when I try it on my database, it doesn't work. So let's take a look at a few of these things, and this is what you're gonna do in that silly little homework. Um, I took the same SQL injection stuff you've been doing and added a couple more here. So this is the one that has a reset button, which is what I need to add to hack us on. And um, all right, so here's the one that blocks apostrophes. And so I've got name and is admin. So normally if I put it, this, this herp derper is in fact an admin. So if I search for his name and is admin equals one, I'll find him. Okay, but if I put an apostrophe here, I, get, I don't get any problem because it throws away the apostrophe. It does not have two apostrophes there. All right, if I put an apostrophe down here, the apostrophe goes in and that breaks the syntax. So you can inject there into a numerical field, but you don't need to inject into a numerical field. You, you can just put things like this. When you, remember, you, we did this before, you used select null to find out how many columns there are. You can just put one union select null. And now you'll get the use select statements have a different number of columns. So as we did before, this is a normal way to find out how many columns you have. You can select another null. And when you hit the right number, you get a row of null. So there are two columns. And so I can, you do not need the apostrophe the way you did up here, because it's a numerical field. The actual query does this, is admin equals is admin. Oh, this is evil, that apostrophe should be over there. Anyway, it's like name with apostrophes, and is admin doesn't have any apostrophes on it. This is a mistake. And uh, so you can now do, you can find the database names by just putting this stuff here with no apostrophe. And that will give you the database names down here. And it doesn't mind putting text in this field that's numerical because I think it's willing to treat that to change the, uh, the structure of the table as needed. And you can go all the way down to dumping names and social security numbers and uploading a PHP shell here. And if someone's filtering out apostrophes, it really won't do them any good. Notice this one here, the only apostrophe it has is that one in the middle, and you don't really need that. I could just get rid of that thing with apostrophes, so I'm not using any apostrophes at all for this injection. And yet, it works. I get the names and social security numbers. So, and you can read it up here, select is admin equals one, union select, there's no need for an apostrophe or special character. That's why filtering on special characters is a very weak defense. It stops the most common injection, but not the others. Now let's try a couple others here. Um, here's the one that blocks select. So if I put um, herp select derper in there, it vanishes and it works. What? Wait, user found, herp derper and is admin, hmm, that's interesting. Why didn't it find it? Username like herp derper and is admin equals one. Well, let's reset the database. I doubt that's the problem though. What did I do wrong? Herp derper, maybe there's an extra character here or something. Herp derper and one should work, and it does. Okay, if I put select in there, it works. Okay, I must add an extra character somehow. And I can also put select down here. And again, it works fine because it's filtering out of both fields. But if I actually want to use select, like this, union select null null, that's going to fail. A bad syntax because it's union null null, the select vanished. So you have to trick it. And like I say, there are various tricks. The simplest one is just change the case of one of the letters. And now it works. Um, a, another one that's fun is S-E-L-E-C-T. And now this has to be capital there. And that should do it. It's now going to throw the select out of the middle, thus leaving select behind. Anyway, that's the game. So that's why, in general, filtering out enumerated evil characters is a mugs game, because the bad guys just have to try more and more clever ways of creating that string without literally typing it in, and you're wasting your time. Filtering for only allowing known good stuff is much safer. Anyway, 
Um, all right, and that's all I have for that one. Now here, all right. By the way, I wanted to try this thing where you put comments in because it just doesn't work, which is kind of weird. So here we are. Um, this, right, this one's working. Right, giving me the names and, and, and credit, social security numbers. And if I put that comment in here, slash star foo star slash, that the book says works. It does not work. So maybe it worked in some old version of MySQL, but not in the new version, or maybe under certain conditions with parameters set or something. But this one, I wasn't able to get any joy with. Anyway, um, that's why it, you gotta know all these techniques because every time you face with a real database, you have to try them all and see what works. There's often funny little wrinkles. Nothing ever goes quite the way the tutorials say they will. All right, and then there's second order SQL injection. See, now there's another response to apostrophe. Suppose you want to store apostrophes in the database, names like O'Neill. Well, the correct way to handle it, according to the tutorials, is if you want to, to use insert to put in a quote, you put in two quotes. The two quotes here will be interpreted as a single quote, and it will put in foo quote. So if you want to store names with apostrophes, that's the right way to do it. So a database that is set up to do it this way, you can put in a name foo quote, and it will put that in a database. The problem is, when it's used later, it can cause SQL injection. Now you put the quote in the database, stored the name. So now, what happens when you try to do a password change? You're going to have select password from username or username equals foo quote. Now you've got a syntax error. Um, and this means to make an exploit, uh, this is a cute one. You make a name like this, apostrophe or one in select password from user for username equals admin. Now the point is one can't be in the password. So this will be an error. But the error will include the field that caused the error. So what happens is when you run this and then perform a password change on that account so it tries to fetch the old password out of the database, it, try, it executes a query that executes this and now it says SQL Server Syntax Error converting the varchar value here to a column and that's the password. So this is cute. Error messages are a fun way to pump out the data. All right, so now all the things we've done so far are what's called not blind SQL injection. SQL injection where the results appear on the web page somewhere or in an error message so you can see what you got. But you might have a query, like when, normally when you're logging in, it doesn't show you the results of the query, it just lets you into like your profile if you're in. And so um, you might have no way to see the answer coming out. So there are other things you can do. By the way, you can do denial of service attacks. Shut down will turn off the server or shut the database service. You can drop tables that or delete some on the That's good, clean fun. Um, I don't think either of these would be possible if you were not running as the database administrator, but it is common for people to just log in as administrator all the time, although it's a poor practice. We'll come to it later, but for defense in depth, you really ought to log be a non-administrative user in your web app. Anyway, um, you may have fields that are numeric and can only be numbers, so you can use functions, ASCII and substring, to pick things out. So if you want to extract a single character, um, returns A, ASCII of A returns 65, so I could do that mess, and I could now get one letter from one field in the database as a number, and then do it over and over and use the numbers to, to spell out what I'm finding. All right, you might be able to set up uh, out-of-band channels of various types. Um, most databases actually let you make network connections from inside the database. This is Microsoft SQL, the earlier version, had this SQL OLAYDB method you could use, and you could now connect it to a server on port 80. And it will then send the data off to that server on port 80. So you can just make an attacking server, send the data off directly from inside SQL. Oracle has a thing called UTL ECDP that does the same thing. You can take data and you can send it off to um, HTTP request, so if you just start a netcat listener on your server, in comes the data, and in this case, they put the answer here, in the name of the font, because you see up there, mpda cacker net colon colon 80 slash, then comes what we're looking for, a username from all users, where row number equals one. We're trying to get the name of the administrator account, and we got it here, the name is sys. This is pretty good, because it's gonna just look like a normal HTTP get, coming out of your, uh, web traffic, so your IDS shouldn't do anything about it. But if you want something that will really go past your IDS, just use DNS. You have to let DNS out or nobody can search the web at all. And so this one here will get host name, and the host name is uh, this select password, where name equals sys, the M5 attacker, and now it's gonna send out a DNS request to your server that has the password hash in it. 
So it's pretty cute stuff. And you can do it from right inside the database. Here's MySQL. We've already used this before, select into out file. This is how we put up a PHP shell. But what I didn't know is you can use this to, set, to reach a shared folder on its server. So all you have to do is set up a um, SMB share on this server and it will send, select the data and send it right up to the server. Set your share to accept it with no authentication, any name and password. So that's pretty cute too. I gotta try that one. That one might be worth adding to a project. All right, now you might be able to execute shell commands. We already know one way to do it by uploading PHP shells, and that's fine, but there, you can also do it directly from inside the SQL database. But once you're able to execute a shell command, you can make FTP, TFTP, mail, tell that commands out, SSH in principle. There are many ways to cause the server to contact your server and hand over the data. Um, you use another technique that you used in the previous project, just copy a file into the web root, and then you can view it in a browser if you have right privileges in the web root. So I got a few eye clickers about that. Grab one if you need one. Anyway, I should be able to add a uh, reset button to Hackazon because I have earned 20 bucks. They haven't paid me yet, but I've earned 20 bucks by fixing Hackazon. So. I actually have been prowling through the code for like four days, so I actually have a pretty good idea how it works now. So I'm going to add a reset button <laughs> since I destroyed it, and you'll all be destroying it too. So anyway, um, but there is just a script. There's always a script that just does a bunch of these inserting twos to build the databases up in their default state, and we're going to need it. Whenever you have a SQL injection database, you have to expect it to be destroyed all the time. So. Yes. Okay, good. Yes, yes. All right. So, which one of these will bypass keyword filters? Thirty. All right, that's the first one there. It's filtering out select that will bypass it. All right. All right. Which one exposes a secret in an error message? C one there. It's going to try to compare this to a number and give you an error message. All right. This one here does not do that. As we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It takes one and it tries to compare them to this password so it won't match. It'll give you an error message saying this can't be a number and print out what it is. <coughs> Which one bypasses comment character filters? Syntax correct, even when you, without using contacts, comments. All right, and which one causes denial of service? at 25 and that's of course drop table okay good all right so not too late we can keep going all right then there's blind sql injection which i've heard a lot about 
and I'm glad to play with a bit. I'm planning to give you a project on it, but I haven't quite figured out how to do it yet. But blind SQL injection is when there is nothing returned to you at all, and you can't find a out of band channel to use. But if you can find any kind of behavior that's different in the two conditions, you can still learn about the database. So here's the usual example. Select from users where username is something and password is something. Now if you put in admin apostrophe dash dash, then it'll be username equals admin end of the thing statement, no more conditions. So you will get, it'll proceed to the next statement, which is probably going to log you in as the admin. So now all you got to do is make true and false statements. So if I put in admin, and one equals one dash dash, this will log me in, and this will not log me in because this condition is false. So now in this parameter, the one equals one and the one equals two, I can put a yes or no question. This is like playing the game 20 questions. You can ask a question and the answer is yes or no. You can ask as many as you like. So now you just have to write a script that will ask you a series of questions that learns whatever you want to know. Typically something like is the first letter of the first database A. Is the first letter of the first database B, and so on, until you find all the information you need. Um, so this is a uh, username that would log in as admin. The first one will, and the second one won't, because the substring 11 is 65, it is not 66. And so questions like this can slowly spell out answers, and you can script them, and SQL map and other tools will do it automatically. Uh, in, yeah? The ASCII function that converts to uh, character to a numeric value. That's right. Yeah, that's right. All right. And um, I don't even think you absolutely need the ASCII function. You can do it other ways. But anyway, th yeah, you can ask any true or false question. Can you explain yeah. that um, more? It's, a, it's ASCII of substring of admin? Yeah. See, this one, you can see what they're doing. <coughs> what you'd have instead of admin would be something you don't know, like the, the name of the first database from the database schema table. So you take that name of the first database, <coughs> And then you say that the first character in it, starting character one, one character, is it equal to A. That's what this asks. And you'll find out if that's true or false. Then you try B, C, D, and E until you get the first letter. Then you get a second letter. That's what these tools do. You, that's, you could ask other kinds of questions, but that's the simplest kind of question, easy to script. And after thousands of queries, you'll have spelled out the contents of the data. And you go through the steps. You find the names of the database, names of the tables, names of the fields, and then you dump out the data. So what gets yeah. returned to you when you what gets returned, if the, if, it, if the condition is true, you log in. If the condition is false, you're rejected. Not allowed to log in. So then you'd have to log out and do another one. So it's going to take a long time and thousands of queries. But it will get you there. So we're basically using the first part as some action we see whenever we are right. in the system or not. And then we are iterating one after another. Yeah, yeah. this login one is a fairly inconvenient one. What's more common is you have some condition where you sometimes have a difference in the page. Like uh, it tells you wrong username or wrong password or one page is somewhat different. This is why um, they talked before how you should really have all your uh, security features in one central library. If people write the error page differently, they might write it a little different. So it has a different wording or something for one kind of error and another error. And that's the kind of thing you can exploit here. All right. So then there's conditional errors. This one here is kind of a cute idea. It will produce an error if the account exists. Uh, this is Oracle. And it, so you have this condition one over zero. This is the thing about these queries. If you select something from a database where a condition is true, it will not even attempt to understand this until it finds that condition to be true. So if the username, if select username from all users where username equals dbsnmp, if this is never true, then it will never look at this. So it will not give an error. If this does happen, it will then try to divide by zero and give you a divide by zero error. So this is another way to provoke a response that lets you ask a yes or no question. All right, and here's the one that asks you whether AAA exists. You've got this thing, it's going to create an error if that account name exists and not if it doesn't. And then you can just step through all the names until you find them. Uh, then there's time delays. If you can't find any difference in the page at all, you can make it go slower if the condition is true. There's a wait for delay function in MS SQL. So if select user equals SA, wait for delay five seconds. If not, it will come back right away, and you make the timing long enough that you can tell the difference. Um, you can ask a yes, no question and get the answer from delay. So here's if the first letter is A, wait for delay. If the first letter is B, wait for delay. You just ask these and see which one takes a long time. That's the first letter. Um, you can test a single bit if you don't want one at a time. There's, uh, 
bitwise and power, so you can make this thing, if substring of admin 1.1, one, one, that's the first letter, and this is a, uh, a binary AND operation, power of 2 to the 0. So that will keep only the least significant bit. And if that bit is greater than 0, wait. So you ask questions where you get one bit out of each question. Now, first bit is 1 or 0, next bit is 1 or 0, next bit is 1 or 0. Trace your way through. Um, might be more efficient than doing one character at a time, depending on how you do it. All right, MS MySQL has a sleep function, which amounts to the same thing. So now if, if user is root, then sleep for 5,000. Uh, for older versions, you don't have sleep, but you have something called benchmark, which will do the same calculation many times. So this will do 50,000 SHA-1 calculations, which will take some time and amount to the same thing. Waste a whole bunch of CPU on the server too, might get you caught. Uh, Oracle doesn't have any functions to cause a delay, but as I've known from being lots of sleazy bash scripts, when you can't find a delay function, you use ping. And here, you use HTTP request and go to a non-existent URL, and it will take time to time out, like five or 10 seconds. So again, it either tries to connect to this URL or it doesn't, and that's your bit. Yes or no answer, yeah. Can you use that on your, on your own host and listen for ICP uh, yes, you could also be listening for those packets to come in, and that would be another way to detect that. would be faster than waiting for delay. Yeah, send it to your server. Yeah. But then you're living with print. Yeah, and remember the, pro the hypothesis here was that you're not allowed to, that's a back channel. So it might be, for example, that something in their network blocks this. But it still has to go through some process of timing out. All right. Um, here's one that causes a timeout if the default Oracle name exists. If there is a name called DBS and MP, then do this URL request, which is going to fail. Otherwise, don't, and it will come back right away. These timing attacks are brutal. In cryptography, they're really brutal. It is very difficult to avoid having things take a different amount of time under different conditions. And then, of course, once you've gone, what else can you do besides SQL injection to a database? Now, if you do SQL injection, you can read all the data in the database. And you might think you're done, but of course, there's a lot more fun things you might want to do. You might want to Many apps probably connect to this database. You might want to compromise those apps and steal more data from other databases. You might want to take over the OS of the database server. Then you, then you can pivot. Now you can put hacking tools on the database server and use it to scan and go into the rest of the network. And this is what people typically do because once you're inside the firewall, there's typically a whole bunch more goodies available that you can't see from the outside. Yeah? That's exactly what happened to Mossack Forensa. Which one? Mossack Forensa. That I think uh, I know that. Offshore company, yeah. Panama Papers. Yeah. That was a big, like one of the biggest mm -hmm. leaks. So their yeah. database was vulnerable. Hacker got all the data, but then he was like, hey, let me check the rest of the server. And he just took over everything. Yeah, happened to everybody. That's the standard way it goes. You take over your web server, your email server first, then they put on hacking tools and pivot, then they take over the database server. Of course, if you use SQL injection, you start the database server, you find a hole somewhere, and then you're in. Another common scenario is you do phishing and some clown at a desktop clicks on the link and installs malware and now you start from there. You don't even have a server, you've got a client, but you're inside the network. So you can see the servers, now you find a vulnerable server or a password hash or something to make the next step. All right, uh, other things you might want to do once you can get um, control of the database server is make database uh, member connections out so you can exfiltrate filtrate data, you can also restore back the functions that the administrator disabled in the database to try to make it more secure. This is like a, another common attack people do is turn off the firewall, turn off the antivirus. You can also make the database more dangerous again. Um, if you get database administrator privileges, you can just turn them back on. This is one of the things that's more hilarious about Microsoft's um, stack protection. Microsoft has write or execute. You cannot write to the stack and execute it by default. So to fix that, you just have to arrange to turn it off. You just get an API call that just allocates memory and turns off that feature, and that's all you have to do. And that's the fundamental weakness of all these things. There's got to be some way to turn it off, and database administrators allowed to, so everything has a kind of obvious off switch. MS SQL, this is a famous one, man. We were hearing about this back when I first started with SQL injection. This is the easiest one where you can just execute commands at the XP command shell right inside the database. So um, this will execute the command IPF, IP config and put it in a file called foo. So in principle, you can do this right inside the database. Now in practice, it's de uh, disabled by default these days. 
but um, there's also you can read registry keys and write registry keys, and that means you can do anything. You can write registry keys, which will then execute a command. Yeah. Will the PowerShell work? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not aware of an MS SQL PowerShell bridge, but there could very well be one. <laughs> it would be only logical for in the in way of thinking to do this. Um, it's a good question. And, and so for after 2005, they disable XP command shell, but all you have to do is turn it back on. Here's the commands that turn it back on if you get database administrative privileges. Yeah. In MySQL, is there a... Um the, in configuration, there's a path specified to where to look for the libraries with the stored procedures. Is there a way to change that from within the database? I don't know, but there probably is. I would think so. Um, that would be good, clean fun. I know in general, this is how you attack a lot of Microsoft operating systems because you can put dills in a lot of places and it will find them. It hunts around for them. And so MySQL, as you already know, you can use into out file to write to a file, like you could write into um, hosts equivalent. You could write into here so that it will have plus plus and let everyone connect. So I think that's for um, X. You could, uh, up here, you can read files, like X password is one people often do to do this. It doesn't really contain passwords, it just contains user profiles, but it's typically what you go for because it's always there on a Linux system and it's easy to see. You can load files off the local system if permissions permit you, and you can write files on the local system or on remote systems if permissions permit you. All right, and then there's tools. If you don't want to do it all by hand, of course, you use a tool. Um, and here's basically what all the tools do, uh, which we've been, do, uh, been doing sort of by example here, but it's probably worth uh, making sure we've talked about the steps. So first you have to find a vulnerable parameter. There has to be some parameter where you can inject code, either by just adding it or finding an apostrophe that makes an error message or something. So then you, have, you um, append various characters, like closing brackets and comments and SQL keywords, and find, now that you've found something that, for example, provokes <coughs> an error message, you have to find some structure that doesn't make an error message. It actually lets you create a valid query that will run. Then you use union or something to find the columns, find the column with the varchar data type, which means you can now hold results. Then you inject a lot of queries to retrieve data and it'll appear in that column you found into which you can inject a command and where you can see the results. If you can't retrieve anything with union, you can try these Boolean conditions and one equals one and one equals two and so on to find out if any of these make any difference in the output. And if that happens, then you can use a uh, condition. Either those are conditional time delays to start asking those yes, no questions. And this is what automated attack tools do. So here's SQL map, which is good, clean fun. Um, I use, you can run SQL map on any system. It's a Python script, but it's in Kali. So I think, which one did I use? Maybe this one? Let's see what this one does. Yeah, that's the one, good. All right, so I should have another window here. I do. There we are. So all I did here, okay, I will go to the same old database right here. And um, if I do one of these, all right, here's what it looks like. SQL raw, um, I'm gonna go back to the first one. So you get a simple case without any filtering or anything. Go back to this one and here's a select query. Okay, and so this is Q equals something or other. So Q could be X and it will then search for the user named X. Um, error in syntax? You had your own I don't query there. What do I have? But I don't have a, oh, this is a select, right? Okay, I'm with you, right. I'm in the wrong form, thank you. It's this one, okay, good, okay. There we are, this one will do it, all right. There, so this is working, and if you put an apostrophe in it, it gives you an error message with syntax error, so you know this is vulnerable. So this is the URL to attack. Now, there's one nasty thing, for some reason, which I don't understand, in any detail, it refuses to use HTTPS. SQL map, this is very common because people use curl and wget and they don't update them enough. They get mad at my certificate, so I cheated. I, my server is available without HTTPS at this, this URL. So that will give you the same thing. So there is a URL that's vulnerable. So now to attack it, the book talks about a complicated syntax, but you don't really need anything. All you need is a SQL map minus u that, and really, 
that's enough. Now what this will do is it will then try to find the vulnerabilities here. So let me make this one big. All right. So it will connect to the server and it will test the connection. Then it will see if Q is dynamic. Okay, then it asks you questions. Let me move this up the screen so it isn't so annoying. All right, do you want to skip test payloads for other DBSs? I do because I know it is MySQL. There's no point trying other things. Do I want to try some fancy tests? I'm going to say no because I don't need them. This is the simplest case. And it's going to now try to do some time-based comparison, which is kind of foolish because you don't even need it. In this case, you have an error message you can see. But really, it doesn't take very long. And it's going to find out, um, okay, Q is generic. It's trying 1 to 20 columns injectable. Do I want to keep trying other things? No. All right. So now all I did was it found that it was vulnerable, and I found a few examples of queries to demonstrate this. Now, if I actually want the data, I just run it with a dump. Now, if I do dump all, it will dump out all the data, which is, this is reasonable in this case because it only has two tables, and it won't take very long to find them. That's kind of cute. It here's trying various timers. Oh, performance timers is on the tables. Yeah, okay, here's the table. So here's one table, and there's the other table. So dump all works, and this is exactly what you see in most of the database dumps from Anonymous and the other hacks. Just the output of SQL map. Everything just scrolling down here. All right, and so in your project, I had you attack Hackazon. Now, if you dump all of Hackazon, it's going to take a long time because it's got all those products, but all I really want is the administrative password hash. So if you dump just the table, just the databases, and then just the table names and field names first, and look for the one you want, you can use more careful commands to dump just the table you want, which is not so bad. Anyway, um, but that's the joy of SQL map. It's just doing exactly the algorithm we just talked about. It's very nice, runs to, and it's what most pros use. Um, unless they're paying for expensive scanners, there might be some pay product, but SQL map is quite common. All right, I think I got a few eye clickers, and I think that's it. Nope, there's another section after this. We'll take a break after this, though. All right, so which method lets you ask yes or no once per query? And I'll quit at 25. All right, and those are the conditional errors. All right. There will be an error if it's yes, and no error if it's no, or something like that. All right. Which one exposes data from local files? I'll quit at 25. All right, and that is load file in MySQL. Okay. And which one allows Windows command injection? Of course, XP command shell. Good. All right. So let's take a break till five after seven. Give you ten minutes. To stretch your legs. We'll figure out how to reset that database. I think there's a simple script you run. I've got the whole thing right here. Um, There's actually a setup script when you install it.